And tonight on episode 200 of PCP, what to do when your kid says they're Christian. And we'll be right back in after a couple of seconds. You're listening to the Pagan Centered Podcast, bringing unique and intelligent perspective to the masses using contemporary technology, allowing for free discussion of one's personal beliefs and enlightenment of those not familiar with a particular religion. We bring to the forefront many issues that are ignored or shunned upon by mainstream religion. We discuss topics on a religious and non-religious level as they relate to a panel representing varied belief systems. Our brute honesty and candid opinion has made us one of the longest running and most popular pagan... Alright, so we'll just have to post-produce all that crap in anyway. <laughs> yeah, it says your broadcast is off. Yeah, I know, that's why I just had to restart okay. the broadcast. Okay. All right, so moving along, we'll get started after this message from the Pagan Veil. So you're looking for a pagan uh, social network that doesn't suck at life. I know there's a lot of pagan social networking sites out there, and a lot of them are based on Ning.com. And uh, I recently signed up for one of those again. I won't mention names. The abbreviation is TI. And wouldn't you know, when you sign up, you always get uh, all crap ton of spam, and then you wind up with like 15 friends with people you don't even know. It's like, um, whatever happened to approving friends? Pagan Veil is not like that. The Pagan Veil is a social network done right. So when you sign up, you can actually just sign up using your existing Facebook account or your Google account or your MySpace account. It's really cool. It'll get you started right off. Uh, you click a couple of buttons, and uh, everyone's manually screened. So this isn't like some social network just anyone can walk into. They're going to manually screen everyone. And it's really awesome. I just signed up today, and I'm going to, over the course of the next few weeks, let you know how it goes. But it's really cool. The friends uh, requests work just like Facebook, where you have to actually approve friend requests instead of random people being your friends automatically. So check them out at thepaganvale.com. So on to tonight's topic. What to do when your kid says they're Christian. I think step one is don't panic. It really is don't panic because a lot of people, I mean, you raise your kids the way that you feel that they're, they're safe and they're loved. And when you, when you see them wearing a crucifix of some tortured man, I mean, it can be a really horrifying experience. And Dave's right. You just need not to panic. You know, I, I think it's important to remember that there are different kinds of Christianity. There's a lot of different denominations. So, um, you know, the, the one thing is before you completely freak out and think that they're part of some really uh, crazy off-the-wall cult, uh, is to maybe educate yourself a little bit about the different Christian denominations and, and talk to your child about, you know, which, which particular tradition of Christianity they happen to be drawn to. I think also it's important to know that the more you as a parent make something taboo, the more your child is going to be drawn to it. So a lot of times kids are going to find themselves being Christian, just trying to rebel against you. And the more you push, um, the more you're going to push them away. This is so strange here. It's <laughs> As silence fell through. Yeah. <laughs> what is what is that clicking falling. noise? Yeah. What is that clicking noise? Why would the post producer set out? I think somebody's going about to going to strangle someone on that. No, oh, God. <laughs> it 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 might be from my end. So somebody in the room is whittling. Uh, yeah, it's coming uh, from you. That's that's, that's okay. The sound. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will move then. Oh, whittling. Huh? I'm in shock right now because of this episode. What? <laughs> Why? <laughs> so as we continue, um, remember that even though that you raise your child and you want them to be safe, that they are free to... Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Hmm? 
No, there's just a lot of background noise. I was confused. Lots of background noise coming from Miles. Then Wallace just said, I'm sorry. But that you okay. want to encourage them and be there for them and encourage them that they do have the freedom to choose their own religion. Um, when it's something different, it can be a little bit traumatic, especially if it's generations back that your family is one particular path, especially if it's one particular pagan path. You want to hand things down from parent to child. And the idea of that breaking that cycle can kind of be traumatic. You, It's the idea of you're losing family, you're losing your history, and that doesn't really have to be the case. But if you, you have to be careful not to push them away. Even though they choose something different, there are many paths to the divine. And showing that them acceptance will encourage them to stay within the family and maybe even carry some traditions on. Now, one thing that I think would be difficult um, is, you know, if if your child becomes overly um, overly concerned with the the concept of sin, um, and if uh, your your child begins to feel as if, uh, you know, he's found this new shiny thing, and he becomes very worried about his family that they need to also be part of this new shiny thing. Um, and and uh, it becomes sort of aggressive about pushing his beliefs. So you know how 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 should people handle that? Um, I think one thing is even though if you think it's silly, don't laugh, don't obviously restrain giggling, don't roll your eyes and sigh, and be careful not to take a patronizing voice. Um. They're always going to be really excited, and they're always going to push, but the more that you show them that you're not getting emotional, eventually their emotions can tone down to where you can have a decent conversation with them. But also keep in mind that while they're rabid and foaming at the mouth, you're really not going to do any type of reasoning with them unless you are very good at communication and can kind of make that low blow to where they can, um, where it knocks the floor out from underneath them. And the other thing to remember, um, you know, coming from a pagan background with a child looking into Christianity is that um, Christianity is, is far younger than many of the pagan beliefs out there. And so it, it will be very easy to show your child where the origins of what they're currently looking into has come from um, and kind of steer them back towards paganism, which is where Christianity got most of their ideas. So their interest in Christianity would be that like these kids who have to have the, the best, newest, shiniest, fun, happy technology have to have the um, Android tablet computer and all these different gizmos and have to have this bright, shiny new religion as well. I'm more concerned with the... Uh, uh if you're not with us, you're against us attitude, but I I, I suppose yeah. a love and support and environment could help out with that a little bit. I heard of that. It's very it's very black or white, no shades of grey oriented. Yeah. And a lot of them have the misconception that I mean they, they do try to teach that unless you are with them, as we said that anything that you say, even though it can be scientifically proven that you are somehow in legion with um, a horned goat man that they, that they worship with negativity, that you're trying to corrupt <laughs> them. So, I mean, it can be a little tricky when it comes to discussions because you do have this, well, it doesn't matter if it makes sense, it's still wrong because, you know, the, the group, 
mentality says that this is the way it is. Um, they do have a Bible that they go by that has a lot of stories, and usually they can pull reference from there. A lot of it hasn't been verified, but, I mean, this is what they go off of. One thing to keep in mind, though, is a lot of the people that think that way, they're the fanatics. They're the crazy people. They're the ones you want to try and steer your child away from. There are plenty of Christians out there, and I cannot believe I'm saying this, that are actually pretty cool. Like, Dave, you remember Adam Esmond Shade, right? Yep. He used to be so freaking crazy. Jesus Mobile, off-the-wall freak. Now, he, I, I respect him as a Christian. There are Christians out there that are very respectful. They are very strong in their faith, but they're not a-holes about it. Those are the kinds of people that if your child wants to get into Christianity, I'm personally, I don't feel it's right that you want to turn them back to paganism because then you're just as bad as your the, the Christians that tried to pull you back into Christianity. But the thing is knowledge and research, and you have to make sure you get them in with the right group of people. You know, I have to agree exactly. with Ashley. There's, there's some really cool uh, versions of Christianity, really cool traditions out there. Um, you know, it would be interesting to explore things like the Unitarian, uh, Universalist Unitarian Church with your child. There's some Quaker and Pagan group, uh, Quaker and Episcopalian, sorry, they're not Pagan, they're Episcopalian um, groups out there that would be interesting to explore with your child. Um, there are authors like Matthew Fox who believe in original blessing, and he's a big fan of Starhawk. Um, there are authors like Margaret Starbird who writes about Mary Magdalene as the goddess in the Gospels. So there, there's lots of places where, you know, you and your child can find meeting ground um, between, between your faiths. Now, Star, on Pathios, you have your featured book. I can't remember the Christian's name. It was like uh, The Answer is Love or something like that. I can't remember the author's name. Be like Loved shame. Now, Ram Das. Yeah, I think so. Are you sure? Because that's the guy that's turning the idea of hell and sin and all that on its head and rethinking it. Oh, no, that's um, Rob Bell. Yes. Rob Bell, yeah, yeah. He believes in the doctrine of love and he denies the doctrine of hell. Um, exactly. And it's, it's causing a big stir right now. And, uh, and, and yeah, he, he rejects the idea that people burn in hell. Um, and... Uh, and and yeah, so there, there's a lot of people out there who are who are kind of cool. Jay Baker is the son of uh, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, the the famous televangelist, and he uh, he believes that God loves everyone. Uh, the Christian he- God loves everyone, and he's he's pro uh, gay uh, rights. So isn't he also kind of punk rock too? I can't remember. He's remember covered him. in tattoos, and he yeah. his church uh, holds uh, meetings in a bar. That's so freaking cool. Jesus would totally do stuff like that. And I cannot believe I'm actually pro-Christianity tonight. That's kind of interesting. Christianity getting a ringing endorsement from our resident <laughs> Satanists. <laughs> <laughs> now that is how you know this is episode 200 of PCP, the slightly <laughs> satirical episode. <laughs> um, I feel dizzy right now. <laughs> Deep, oh. slow breaths. <laughs> I would add, however, that there are polytheistic forms of Christianity. However, they are the most dangerous forms. Catholicism, for example, has five gods. However, yes, it does. if you look back at Rome, it pretty much annihilated the Roman Empire. Hmm. <laughs> Everyone's so quiet. <laughs> You know, you know, one thing to remember too is that there there are forms of Christianity that are actually really similar to 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 paganism. Um, uh, a good friend of mine, a druid, um, pointed out to me not so long ago that Pentecostalism is really just Christian Christians shamanism, um, and I, I found that rather rather interesting. It made them. Um, uh, I was able to sort of relate a little bit better to their ideas after she told me that. Well, on the topic of Catholicism, it's kind of interesting. Um, one of our fellow podcasters, uh, Ada Nodenson, over at the Secrets in Plain Sight, uh, firmly believes that at one point he encountered uh, Pope Benedict back before he was a pope, actually back in the 1970s. 
And one of the interesting things, um, you know, he remembered from that conversation is like, dude, it's kind of weird to think of a Catholic, you know, being a supporter of religious, equal religious rights for everyone. You know, normally it's just more rights for us and let's not really care about those, you know, those people are on the wrong path. And this particular Catholic uh, priest at the time, you know, he had some really unique thoughts on it. And then one day he picks up a book from the Pope, <laughs> and what do you know, those, those same thoughts pop up. It's like, oh, wait a second, that guy did have a German accent. So uh, it's interesting how things like that can uh, go around, and it's, it's kind of interesting that the pagan connection that has. Well, perhaps you can encourage them to uh, find a... Uh form of Christianity with some uh, syncretic uh, beliefs in it. I don't know. Personally, I don't feel right inhibiting anyone's choice in religion because I know I really didn't appreciate that. Like, I guess I the only thing I would really pressure or put any kind of importance on for my child if they want to become Christian is do your research. Make sure you know what you're getting into. A lot of people are crazy. There's a lot of dangerous people out there in any religious spectrum, stripe, color, whatever. Just be careful. And there seems to be an in, uh, just an inordinate number of Christian ones, too. You, you, they're the ones that they, they turn around and they start screaming. You know, there's the, that group that was on... Um, talked about on the wild hunt that was rejoicing over all the death of the non-christians in japan i mean uh, get into that yeah that i would run screaming away from <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah but thankfully oh, those are in the minority mm-hmm. yeah well, they were even dumb enough to think that the japanese are all atheist mm-hmm. no the japanese have a more diverse faith system than we do by far and much more ritualistic than anyone in our culture is but you know they're all heathens and remember Pearl Harbor they're getting what they deserved oh it was oh yeah I I guess two nuclear bombs after bombing a military base wasn't enough they need to have a tsunami and an earthquake they're just jealous because they sell more cars here (laughs) The video of that girl saying, after two days of prayer, look at all the people that were killed. Really? And this is a religion of love and tolerance. No, not that sect which she's in. Scurvy, thank you for bombing that girl. I did no such thing. You just put the information out there and let the forces of Anon take hold. PCP doesn't condone Anonymous. And we're not going to say we're not in support of them. (laughs) (laughs) Just making that clear. (laughs) Somehow. I confess, one thing about Christianity really does confuse me. There's all these different branches, sects, denominations, call them what you will, of Christianity. There's Catholic and Protestant and Lutheran and Mormon and all these different sub-casts of Christianity. And they all hate each other, and they can't stand each other, and each one proclaims to be the one way to the one God that they all collectively supposedly worship. I'm trying to come to terms with the idea of a monotheistic faith being internally so discordant. I know, I was like just looking at some of the reviews and endorsements for uh, Robert Bell's book, that that love is the answer, like the the main book he has. And the Christians there are ripping each other apart. I'm like, we don't even need to worry about half these people. They're too busy killing each other off. Exactly. All we have to do is wait and they'll annihilate each other and we it it won't be an issue anymore. Well actually like, that was that was the theory um way back in the day. It was only with Constantine when he made it the uh he decriminalized it and made it the uh, the state religion that it actually became cohesive. Um, it was actually a lot of a lot of pagans originally believed that there was no threat from Christianity because they were so violent um, yes. in their in their inter inter Christian uh, uh, interactions that they would actually just kill each other off. Um, 
so it wasn't until they were given a common cause to work towards, uh, which was political, that they actually um, were able to work together for a period of time. So then, if your child becomes a Christian, would you have to be concerned about the child turning against you, the pagan parents, or turning against all the other Christian kids they might encounter, or both? I, th I think the greatest concern is that they may turn quickly to atheism. Okay. No, no, they, 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 no. Uh, he, Nerea brings up a very good point. I mean, there's been a lot of instances of um, what happens is somebody, you know, starts getting it into people's heads. Well, this is God's plan. God it makes everything happen. The world goes around because of God. And basically, they wind up in the logical uh, corner of, well, if you believe in God, you must hate God. So I'd much rather hate. I'd rather be apathetic than hate because hate is a really time-consuming emotion. So, they want to be an atheistic. Well, just as a bit of trivia, um, atheist as a term was originally used to describe uh, the Christian faith because they denied uh, so many gods. Um, it was actually originally a term used by the pagans, uh, the ancient pagans, for the Christians. Because all they have is only one god, and they think that's sufficient. I think my biggest concern, um, and it, it's more, um, it's not necessarily every Christian sect, because um, there's, there's so many out there, and we really can't even get them to agree on one point. Christians are kind of like herding cats, if I can use that analogy. But... Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would worry about them becoming cannibals. There are some Christian sects out there that really believe in eating body and blood of their Lord, and that, that's kind of hardcore. That's really so hardcore. We, well, we acknowledge that the, that the green man is in the grain that we eat, and we eat, and the bounty of the harvest and all of that. They take out the middleman. They don't all the with the grain and the bread, and just choose to eat the god directly. That's a bit disturbing. Well, it depends on a different denomination. Some believe it's literally their their deity. Some believe it's symbolic of their deity. I mean, I'm sure there's parallels in paganism. Oh, possibly. Oh, I guess you could sort of um, compare it to the Great Rite, you know. Uh, it's either... Uh, right. A lot of people think of it as being actual, when in reality it's really symbolic, symbolic for most people, <laughs> and the people who do pr uh, practice it actually are uh, are considered a bit odd. So, so, so I could see that as being, uh, as being uh, a fair <laughs> analogy. <laughs> so you are equating sex with cannibalism. Good. Well, no, no, no. I'm just talking about uh, oral sex? rituals that are rituals <laughs> that are ha, ha, ha. rituals that are misunderstood. Rituals that are misunderstood. No, no. There is no. Uh, there is no. Uh, there's no. No. There's no. There's no like cannibalistic equivalent in paganism, to my knowledge. Um, maybe, maybe in some some strange beliefs in the in the South Seas, but um, no, that's that's an important thing. Um, you know, you know, we we believe in in things being purified and made clean, and and there's nothing clean or pure or holy about that. So it's 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 odd to want to ritually eat someone. I think the other main concern of mine is that um, many Christian sects try to remove human sexuality from the whole of human experience, and it, it causes a lot of problems, um, especially, you know, coming from a pagan perspective where we recognize that, that you know, sexuality is kind of a part of who we are. Um, there seems to be a lot of negative 
kind of outburst from different Christian sects from suppressing those norms, whether it be, um, you know, miseducation or um, a later teen rebellion that results in um, people kind of going crazy. Um, I, I would worry about, about that kind of denial about, you know, basic human nature. I have a question. I have to ask this. If one of their tenets is that the Christian God is their father and they eat their father, if I am a pagan parent of a Christian son and he comes at me with a knife and fork and a gleam in his eye, what do I tell him? <laughs> oh, bleep! I'm sorry. And I always thought it was weird that, you know, the the, uh, the bread and, and wine that they use to represent, you know, the god of all of creation really tastes like crud. It is kind of bland. <laughs> like you would think if he's the lord of all, he'd have some kind of spice or flavor or... He should, he's essentially stale and sticks to the he should, no, see, no, Christian. They don't have any spice or flavor. Well, see, that's that's the problem when you when you when you borrow rituals from other faiths and you don't understand the ritual, you're you're apt to get it very wrong, and and and, and that's a case of that. You know, uh, partaking of a ritual meal is something that they borrowed, and yeah. and then they didn't quite do it right. So, so um, and and that's and, that, and that's a, that's you know that's a problem. Um, you know, uh, they they in. The churches they have altars, but they don't like use them. I, I don't even know why they have them. So the monotheistic faith they have one god, and so their bread has one ingredient. It's a <laughs> monotheistic bread made of flour, um, and on the altar is one thing which looks like a misshapen uncross, right? Um, okay. I have to confess, I'm really not seeing the plus side to following that faith yet. Well, I, I think we've just made and, the same and, and mistake. One that, more question. Well, uh, I have to ask this: what, 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 what do Christian vegetarians eat? Tofu, so, Jesus. No. <laughs> <laughs> if you're if you can't have gluten, the Pope has declared that you are not a Catholic. So. Oh, really? Did he really? Yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. you remember that whole thing with the gluten, the person who was allergic to gluten, and they had the gluten-free wafers, and that whole thing went all the way to the Vatican? Yep. No, I missed that one. <laughs> but I think we've just made the same mistake that the, the Catholics over at In the Arena did with the, their pagan episode. They're like, oh my god, these people believe crazy crap. Let's talk about their crazy crap of a belief. <laughs> The topic at hand as to what to do when your kid says they're Christian. That's true. right. Okay, back on point. Well, you know, I think I think it's important to to sit down and have an honest conversation with your child about why they feel the need to convert. You know, it it may not be so much that they are embracing Christian doctrine or Christian theology, um, or, or feel personally called to Jesus, um, but it could be that you know they feel like they don't have a place within paganism. You know, if, you, if you've raised your kid to be religious, if you've raised your kid to be pious, um, and yet your, your child feels like they are um, ostracized in, in, you know, the pagan community, then that may have more to do with it than, than religious motivation. I mean, if your child, um, you know, is a, a football playing you know, Republican, he he may not feel comfortable in the pagan community, and he may actually feel more comfortable within Christian communities. So, so maybe you know you should talk to them about that and and be aware of ways to make your personal and your community practice more inclusive of your child. One thing I think I would do in the event that a ch that my child wanted to be Christian is I'd take them to church as early a mass as possible, and they'll decide on their own whether they want to continue. 
if they want to continue waking up the <laughs> ass crack of door to pursue their religion, that's one way to do it. And don't forget the Christian aerobics. Up, down, up, down, up, down. Wait a second. Don't we do the same thing in Wicca? You know, have our <laughs> rituals at dawn and then do lots of exercise? <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> I don't. I don't know what what branch of of Wiccanism that you're practicing, <laughs> Dave. But but I, uh, being traditional, you know, I practice underneath the full moon at night. Um, so you wake uh, up even earlier. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm so early. I wake up yesterday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, do do we want to um to sort of do some debunking here? I think we can somehow get this episode back in its sarcastic tone. <laughs> somehow, <laughs> right? Okay, with this well, next I can, segment, <laughs> I, I can start with a little bit of uh, debunking. Um, uh, not all Christians are homophobic. Um, not all Christians are misogynistic. You can usually, it's usually pretty easily, easy to, def, to, uh, to identify these groups. Um, you know, it's not like they're going to be, uh, secretly homophobic or secretly misogynistic. It's usually pretty clear in their doctrine. And if you talk to other Christians, um, they can help you steer you on the right path to make sure that your child doesn't end up in a group that's, uh, that's one of these minorities that are homophobic or misogynistic. I like our chat room. Not all members of the British Navy are cannibals. <laughs> Good. <laughs> are we <Yay>. certain about this? <laughs> they said not all. They didn't say there were none. <laughs> Maybe it's the lack of limes. What do you think, Scurvy? <laughs> <laughs> I love you too, Star. <laughs> I think that's beautiful. I, th I think that's wonderful. I mean, one thing you can do, and, and when Star is saying about, you know, not all of them hate homosexuals and things like that, you can always insist that you they allow you to come with them to a mass and maybe see if you can take part or... Even talk to the priest or pastor or minister, as they call their leaders, and see if you can just have a discussion and ask him some questions. And usually that's a good way to get some bearings on how far to one end or the other that they, that they go. Right, and you, and you probably want to, to contact the minister or priest ahead of time to make sure that there's not any requirements um, you know, some, some Christians, uh, require that you have your head covered. Some require that you wear a skirt. So you want to make sure that you, you honor their and respect their, uh, individual taboos regarding ritual. And even though you may not agree with what they're saying, you know, as Star said, make sure to contact them beforehand, but don't stand up in the middle of, of their ritual and cause a scene. You may not like it, and that's something to discuss with your child afterwards, but there's really no need to stand up in the middle of, of one of their rituals or one of their masses and go, how dare you not like homosexuals, and storm out. That can really be done in private and in a discussion. Don't right, make your child right. feel bored. Yeah, and you know, and when, and when, you know, you may not want to indulge in, in, in prayer or anything like that, but instead of making a scene about stepping away from it because, you know, you know, you don't, you know, particularly care for this particular deity or how they're honoring them, you know, it's, it's just, you know, be polite, just sit there quietly and you don't, you don't have to participate, but you don't have to make a scene either. And whereas another uh, a myth or a thing that we have to go over is that, you know, in paganism, a lot of us believe that babies are born innocent. And there are a lot that believe that babies are born with um, wrongs already done. Um, they call it the original sin, that they have to be cleansed of that. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's one of those beliefs that, like, Christians hold but they don't necessarily act on like if you if you actually talk to Christian parents, um, e even though they hold that belief, they still treat their children as if they are special and blessings. Um, it's it's one of those sort of odd beliefs that you know 
they 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 give lip service too, but um, it, it doesn't play out in their actions. Right. I really think the only time where I've seen that come into play is if there is a a parent and they find out that the child hasn't been baptized. And really, it's it's out of concern. It's not really that they hope that your child is wrong or not cleansed, but that it's out of concern in which they, they hold that belief that they want to baptize and cleanse it. So it's, it is because they care, even if we see it as a little bit twisted. You know, wh- one thing I think we haven't, we haven't touched on, and I think it's really kind of important, is you have to also remember... Um, you know the the their main liturgy. Their well, they're not their liturgy, but their 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 main holy text is the uh, the Bible. And um, one thing that you know may freak out parents, um, and they may have heard rumors or stories about it, is the uh, the amount of violence in the Bible. Um, and even though some of their scriptures and holy texts are, are very violent, um, bordering on genocide. Um, you know, it's, it's important to remember that that's, you know, ancient text and that, uh, that Christians don't necessarily engage in, in violence today. Not all Christians believe in violence and not all Christians believe that those, um, those texts are particularly applicable to their lives. So, so you need to, uh, sort of, um, put that into perspective, you know, they're not going to, to crusade. Um, they're not going to get your your child involved in you know some bloody battle against you know other other faiths. So um, um, there may be a small minority who feel that way, but for the most part, you know the 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 violence in there is is sort of anecdotal. And I mean, there are some really nice, pretty stories in there, so it's not all blood and gore. I mean, there is stuff about being kind to thy neighbor and things like that. So there are some positive things, even amongst the really horrifyingly gory stuff. Yeah, and there's this awesome character in the New Testament that reminds me of PCP. I'm not going to give away names, but a lot of people worship him now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he kind of does remind me of PCP now. I can... Yeah, I can see some members of PCP, like, overturning money-changing tables and, and being like, what the hell do you think you're doing? Um, you're, you're cheating people, and that's not cool. Um, so, yeah, and, and the people of PCP definitely do sit down with all manner of people <laughs> and hang out with them. <laughs> so... I mean, we do even go against the grain of, of the more modern, even in the pagan community. Eh, we don't quite go with the grain as, as most people, and we're willing to speak our minds. So there, there are a lot of positive things that you could glean out of the stories like that. You just have to have an open mind when you're reading them. Definitely. And one of the things you have to really remember is that especially if you have a daughter and and your daughter is interested in Christianity is that, you know, a lot of the stories about women are based uh, on ancient cultures and that specific time. And that most Christians don't feel about women today, the way the scriptures portray women. There's um, uh, many, well, actually most of the women in the Bible um, are portrayed with some sort of sexual taint or deficiency and um, just because, you know, these ancient stories have that slant doesn't necessarily mean that, that Christians feel that way today. It's um, more with the ancient culture uh, than it is with the way people practice it today, although there are exceptions to that. And you also have to look all in, as well as what uh, brand of Christianity you're looking at, because some uh, sects are going to limit the uh, role of women, and other ones are going to be more inclusive. Um, it may be something uh, to look at, um, especially if your child is female, um, to see exactly how, uh, you know, what they feel a, a proper role is, if they feel there are proper roles for women, and if you want your child um, to be involved in a group that promotes that. You, you know, Sam, you bring up a really good point there. Um, 
and and it made me think of something, and it's something that that pagan parents need to be aware of. Um, if if the Christian group that your your child is drawn to um, has multiple marriage, it's not the same as polyamory. Um, it's actually kind of scary. The the way they practice it is sort of strange and unnatural, and um, you want to be concerned if if the Christian group that your your child is interested in participating in and a part of. Um, practices multiple marriage because what they're doing is not polyamory and uh, and can be very dangerous. Also, the creation myth um, for all of Christianity blames uh, evil coming into the world on women. Um, so whether your child is looking at a sect that um, has women um, ministers or you're looking at a sex that um, really segregates women from worship um, or participating in some ritual. Um, what it boils down to is that women, women brought evil into the world, and the way evil was brought into the world was through knowledge, um, which is really a frightening precedent to base a religion upon. Okay, I, uh, since it, it was brought up and all that stuff, we were just sort of wondering, uh, what about child safety and all that? I'm, I'm, I heard that um, certain uh, um, sex of this, um, 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 well, that's, just, that's the sound of little boys make while they're doing the, their um, special duties. Ministerial <laughs> duties? Yes. Um. Hey, lip service. Yes. I'm sorry. Did I go there? Yeah, yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah. How, how how do you guarantee that the uh, that your kid's going to be safe in this particular faith? Especially in a, whatever a branch religious of it. path where the uh, the actual religious practice dictates that uh, you actually let the priest be alone with your young child. And it's not just, well, I mean, you're saying priests, so you're talking about uh, Catholicism, which is just one branch of it. But there's also, you know, there, there are some groups and, and, and sects uh, where you, you leave your child with, like, a babysitter and your child's not actually allowed in the main worship service. Or, you're, or your child's supposed to go in a separate class away from you. So how do you, how do you guarantee your child's safety there? How do, you, how do you maintain that sort of safety for them? And if there's take their word at it that they'll be as good as they claim that they're going to be with your kid and what they and what they promise to teach the child will be one can assume a watered down version of what the parents are learning or practicing or worshipping, I assume. And I think when when letting your child do anything you have as soon as they say, no, we don't want you, no, you can't check up, as soon as they're exclusionary to you and want to act like they're hiding, their chi hiding your child, no, they're saved, you can't come near them, then I mean you might want to have a, a problem. But if you find that they're opening and welcoming and, and trying to in include you, then I think we might have you know, a little bit more trust than we can extend to that particular parish. I mean, you have to understand that not all of them are the same and all of them are going to be different. Just like our groups, we have positive and negative and, you know, there's people that want to induct children into sex via their own coven. Yeah, some churches can be quite similar. So it's, again, it's experience. You really have to be willing to experience things with your child, I think, I think, instead of just letting them go. Go ahead, Sam. Um, I, I'm somebody, I taught catechism in a Catholic church for years um, before I, I converted. And really what it comes down to is anytime you are 
relinquishing supervision of your child to anybody, it doesn't matter what group they say they're affiliated with, you still as a parent have a responsibility to um, check in on exactly what is going on and also to be responsible for researching people that um, are going to be in charge of your children. Um, I think the biggest problem is that people were putting far too much trust in people, forgetting that that all religions are run by people and not actually by, you know, God. Um, I don't think any pagan group has ever tried to call down a deity, shove kids in a room, lock the door, and think that they're being watched. Um, but for some reason, there was far too much trust put into a lot of these Christian groups and thinking that because they are running under the guise of, of, a, of their God, that only good could have been done. Um, you know, the, the daycare that went on at the church uh, that I worshipped at was really awesome because you didn't have crying babies. Um, you know, where a lot of pagan groups um, may have an age limit, a lot of Christian groups do not. So if you can imagine how absolutely annoying it is to be trying to put up circle, which is basically what they're doing, and then have babies crying and kids running around and who's having a temper tantrum. Um, so the daycare part was awesome. Um, but it's still... Oh, crap, I have background noise. I don't know. Let's end the rant. Yeah, I mean, you've just got to use common sense, you know, just as you would check out any babysitter that you would have for your child, you know, you need to check out any sort of um, teachers or gurus or priests that are that are going to be teaching your, your children. It's not something where you can, you know, you, you shouldn't ever, ever, ever just drop your kid with strangers and assume they'll be okay because they're in a religious environment. I mean, and also lock for um, those who try to t to convince your child that they have direct contact with their God, and nobody else does. So you would have to go to them, or your child would have to go to them to get an explanation of something. You don't want your child to be around you know, a cult leader and such that they're not teaching them to be self-sufficient, but they're teaching them that, that they themselves have the answer and your child is so blessed to have come to them for answers. You know, that's, that's a good a point. That, because, you know, another thing you want to watch for is people who want your child to confide in them and to confide in them things that they wouldn't even tell you, you know, and try to win their confidence that way. Some groups uh, insist that you actually confide your secrets um, uh, with your with your clergy and that's that's a little disturbing to me so they they advise recommend enforce I'm saying enforce is the wrong word they promote a level of separation of confidence between the Christian child and the non-Christian parent. Yeah. Right? E. Um, I'm dubious, I confess, about the exclusionist mindset. Yeah, the... I mean, in any any situation, anybody that wants to break up a a family is something that's dangerous. But then when you add in threats, um, a lot of them will say, "Well, if you if you continue to talk this way, or if you continue to talk about this subject, that you know, after you die, they will threaten immense amounts of pain and torture." So it's it's more manipulation than it is enlightening, and yeah, I'll agree, Miles. That's that's pretty dubious. 
Yeah, you also want to watch out for for anyone who tells your your child that you know, um, you won't understand that you won't understand what they're going through, and that they understand better what your child is going through, and that. You know, you're never going to get it and uh, and that, you know, your child just sort of needs to shut off from you. And and hopefully you have a good enough relationship with your child that even if they are seeking out other religions out of a sense of rebellion, that you can still have an honest enough conversation with your child to know if uh, if the uh, the clergy are, are priests or whatever of of this Christian group that they're involved in is, is, you know, trying to drive a wedge between you and your child, because that's, that's really not, not a good thing. Um, you know, especially the whole idea that, you know, you need to come here, even if, you know, your parents don't agree with it. And, you know, you need to come here, even if your parents don't understand, because we understand you and we're here for you and we're your new family. That's, that's kind of creepy. And, and, and that happens. It happens. Way too more, way too often than I'd like to admit. Yeah. You, you know, yeah, one you thing that um, that pagan parents may not know, um, and that might be useful to explain is that uh, uh, Christians do not worship Asherah. Um, they don't worship Dagon. They don't worship Baal. They don't worship El. Um, you know, there, there may be this idea that because they are descended from, um, Canaanite and Sumerian religion and the Semitic religions of the Middle East that, uh, that they're actually very similar to, uh, to the, the polytheism of that, that area. And, and they're, they're not, they actually have a very, um, a very narrow, uh, definition of, of those gods, um, and they've even considered some of the uh, some of the ancient gods from that uh, region to be uh, to be demons. So you know you shouldn't you shouldn't expect that you know um, your 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 child will be allowed to to offer up like you know like cakes and libations to the queen of heaven because even though that's part of you know Christianity's sort of upline. It's it's not what they practice, and it, and it wouldn't be allowed in their groups. I had a thought, and then it just left. <laughs> <laughs> what is that beeping? Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> um, one thing to also um, be wary of when dealing with your kids is with any big change, a lot of them are looking for approval as well as looking to break off from you. So if they do make the change from Christian or from paganism to Christianity, a lot of them will start showing it. And trying to show it loudly, um, whether it's wearing large pieces of Christian paraphernalia in their jewelry, um, T-shirts, bumper stickers, symbolic patches. And you have to make sure, don't point at them and say, you know, get this blasphemy out of my house and make a big deal out of it. You know, well, that'll do is reinforce them. Yeah. yeah, just just like just like any any kids who convert to paganism from any Christian religion, they're gonna have their fluffy bunny stage too. So it's kind of just deal with it <laughs> without making a huge deal about it. Right. I mean, if they want to say a prayer for their Jesus at a, a holiday meal, you know, everybody smile and hold hands and and humor them. And the more that you show them that you're not going to hold them at arm's length because they're different, the more that they'll tone down and be willing to actually have a a civil discussion with you whenever the time comes. Yeah, yeah, if you give them something to rebel against that they they will. Um, you know, it just occurred to me something we haven't talked about and it's it's a reason why um you know, your child might be drawn to Christianity. 
um, for the wrong reasons. And that is, you know, most people convert or change religions in their teens. And, you know, in your teens, you've got all of these hormones and everything going on. And, um, you know, the, the hormones, the, uh, the burgeoning sexuality is, is a very difficult time for kids. And, and some children may feel that it's easier to, to embrace um, celibacy, abstinence, um, in order to remove those pressures from themselves. Um, like, for instance, if you have a daughter, she may start talking about entering, um, you know, convents. That, that, that may be something that she wants in her future. And it may just be that, that she's having trouble coping with, um, with puberty. And it's easier for her to align herself in a place where all of those decisions and stresses are, are removed from her. And that's another thing that we can expand upon is that, you know, just like you're saying with the hormones and the sexual aspect, whereas pagans, we try to teach a lot of self-accountability and, you know, we do know that our gods really aren't going to hold our hand. There's a lot of Christian faith that will encourage the child to give their problems to their deity so it is kind of a relinquishing of responsibility and can make it a lot easier and make it feel like the world isn't so stressful. And it also means that they can push off their problems to somewhere else. You know, they can externalize their problems a lot easier. A lot of pagan pants don't have the the easy approach to things. They have the, a lot of pagan pants have the sit down, shut up, and fix it type of approach. Whereas Christianity, you can sit back, kick back, say a few hail mary. Hail, Hail Marys, you know, say a few Our Fathers and kick back some of that, uh, you know, some of that wine and eat some of that bread and you're good to go. Mm-hmm. I can definitely um, admit when I, um, right before I got into paganism, um, I was raised very, 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 very Christian and I was very, very, very devout. And I very, very, very much was awkward. And so I was a 12-year-old asking my mom to get me a chastity ring and because I wanted to join a convent for exactly the reasons Star talked about. It was much easier to put myself into a place where the awkwardness was completely removed because it was shunned upon or it wasn't allowed. And, and it really stunted my growth. Um... I, I grew out of that, thankfully. Um, but it, it's more than just theory that starts talking about. I definitely lived through it. Yeah, it's it's been they, there have been interviews with with young nuns um, in, in different Christian organizations, and and that's actually been listed as one of the the number one reasons why young women um, enter in because then they don't have to to deal with those stresses, and they they also don't have to deal with the stresses of of their family, of caring for elderly parents or, or helping um, sisters and brothers raise their families. They're, they become really quite divorced from, from their family life. And, you know, and that's a complete sort of um, shunning of, of pagan virtues of, uh, you know, being, being a part of your community and, and respecting your ancestors and family. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's you know that and that's something that parents might find that will be a difficult thing is this idea that you know their kid um, may feel suddenly that you know um, they can do things that normally they would not have been allowed to do, um, and then insist that you forgive them, um, and, and that it be the end of it. And uh, and so you know those sorts of uh, rebellious behaviors. Um, you know, it is it, something you're going to have to keep an eye out for, um, because that's not that's not the way the world works. And it also definitely fills a child's requirement for um, social drama. Um, I know when I was fervently Christian, I got just the same amount of of um, attention and notoriety from my peers in school. Um, that I did when I decided to follow a pagan path and, and was vocal about that. Um, so even though perhaps celibacy um, or 
or Christianity may not be a cool thing. It definitely does kind of give you that outsider kind of edge that, that some kids really identify with. And then there's the other side of that, of the whole, you know, sexuality coin, even though, you know, we, we hold sexuality as sacred and something that doesn't necessarily needs to be smushed. And you had one side that's completely celibacy and either end of that will get you ridiculed. You're either a slut or you're frigid. And so they're trying to figure out how to, how to hide from all the drama and, and all of that anyway could push you to either side. If that made any sense. No, it did. It did. And thinking about it, I think part of it could be not just the sexuality, but structure in general. I mean, they, they do have pretty clear cut. You know, the Christian does have a very clear cut. This is right and this is wrong. And if you go to the leader of that, that particular fat path or church, a lot of times they will be able to give you a very direct, this is right, this is wrong, and makes fitting in pretty easy. Yeah, it, it, it absolves you of having um, self-examination to some degree. Um, you know, you know Greek, Greek philosophy teaches us that there's nothing worse than an, an unexamined life. Um, but when you have all of the answers for you all laid out, that sort of, um, you know, completely goes in the face of, of a, a lot of um, pagan ideals there. And, you know, another thing I, I was thinking about is, you know, <clears throat> they, the, they believe that, you know, part of their faith is to, uh, to bring other people into their faith. You know, uh, you have to get more people to to join the, the tradition um, in order to be practicing the tradition correctly. Um, so, you know, there's, there's pressure to bring your, your friends and your family along into it. And, you know, that's something that, that pagan parents should watch out for because that totally flies in the face of hospitality um, and, you know, our, our, our ideals around, around manners. Um, and that's, that's one thing that you would have to have a long talk with your child about that, you know, you can't, be inhospitable to people um, uh, because you found this new new faith. Something I heard once which really gave me pause was advice from Christians to little kids aged like four, five, six. And the advice was that if you don't bring two people a day into Christianity, you make Jesus cry, which what? means that, yes, not only are they, are they giving the kid a quota, they're also giving the kid a guilt complex that they have made their God upset and probably dispro disapproving of their behavior if they don't fulfill this quota that somebody established somewhere. Yeah, the, the guilt complexes are really a problem. I'm not even sure how to, to combat that because when you, when you give such direct goals and some of them can be very easy and then you give them a hard goal, the children have this want and need to fulfill goals so they try even harder and with hormones going on and life changes, you know, especially when they start getting into the teenage years, it's hard on them, you know, and they want so hard to belong to part of this group and you telling them, honey, it doesn't matter what other people think as long as you're happy, as long as you're safe. And yet here's their leader saying, no, no, it matters. You have to get everybody to believe the way you do. It's, that's a really rough spot to put a kid in. You talk about peer pressure. <laughs> right? I mean, they, they, they talk about, you know, trying to defend yourself from, from peer pressure in school. You just adding that on in a, in a spiritual environment. You talk about, you talk about just torture 
Uh, and not even that, you have the you have the peer pressure, but then you have looking for adult. That's like saying, you know, a teacher saying, well, if you can't get two of your classmates to spell big words properly a day, you'll fail out of school. I mean, that's a ridiculous ideal to put on anybody, let alone a child. And, and, and you know, your, your child hasn't been raised to behave that way. So that's going to be behavior that's completely foreign to them. And it's going to make them uncomfortable. And that's something you need to talk to your child about, about, you know, um, if, if this sort of thing makes them uncomfortable pushing, pushing their, their religious views on others, if it genuinely makes them uncomfortable, then, then they need to, uh, to sort of reexamine how they're going to fit into this new faith that they found. Um, because, you know, you don't, you, you, your child needs to understand that, you know, they don't have to fit into, uh, you know, a round hole if they are a square peg. On these thoughts, though, it's important to bear in mind that these are seriously Christian beliefs, that it is a myth that Set and Loki are worshipped by Christians. Loki is not so cruel as to make people eat the Eucharist. Flesh, maybe, but not the Eucharist. <laughs> Barbecue at my place. <laughs> you know, and that's that's one thing you really need to talk to your kid about, that, that, you know, just because there are similarities, that doesn't mean that Odin is the same as Jesus, or that Addis is the same as Jesus. Um... You know, you don't want him to be getting that that mixed up, where he's he's bringing Christian um, ideas and the the ideas surrounding Jesus um, into into uh, you know pagan circles um, and, and getting that confused. Um, you you want to make sure that there's a, there's a clear delineation between between like Odin and Jesus um, because they are very different and they have very different values. And going along with deity, um, a lot of them will acknowledge that, you know, they have the, the, the main god and they have the Jesus god and they also have the evil. But whereas we look at our gods and we can see balance like Loki and Set, that they are necessary and that they are positive forces, even if we don't like it, that they are, are good forces to have. Their negative deity is the epitome of everything that is bad and to be avoided at every turn. It's not a necessary anything. He is everything that is wrong. So you have to, to watch for the balance aspect that that religion is holding for them. Is saying Loki's good a uh, um, probable cause for attracting Loki's attention? Perhaps. Well, Loki... <laughs> I think that Loki, like Set, is good in that they are teachers of behavior. They show us how to achieve beneficial or benevolent results by showing us the error of our ways. Right? Everything goes silent because I have a picture of Christ checks on the video feed right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, one thing uh, that would concern me, that would concern me a lot, um, is, you know, Christians have a very specific form of initiation. And the different traditions have different uh, initiations. It's, it's usually an initiation by water baptism. And, um, you know, before your child does that, you know, that's a sacred oath, that your child needs to understand the consequences of that. Um, you know, some people feel that, you know, oaths aren't valid until you're uh, considered an adult, so you're like 18 or 21. Um, some people feel like 12 or 13 is when, when oaths um, become serious. But, you know, your child needs to understand what they're doing before they go through something like that. And they also need to understand that just because you're 
initiated into one Christian tradition does not mean you're initiated into all Christian traditions. For instance, if you're initiated um, into the, the Catholic tradition, that does not necessarily mean you're initiated into the Baptist tradition. And if you're initiated into the Baptist tradition, that does not necessarily mean you're initiated into uh, Pentecostalism because they have very, very different uh, uh, perceptions on, on initiation and initiation requirements. Well, it's like if you're Wiccan and you're an... If you're an initiate of a Wiccan coven, then you could not just assume to walk into a Druid grove or a heathen bloat and, and expect to be welcomed in as one of their own. Um, but I'm still, I confess, a bit confused about they have different sects and subclasses within the one banner of Christianity, supposedly under the same deity. Um, I get that they have different rights and um, tenets of practice within each of these subclasses, but you'd think if they all believe in the same single deity who promotes love and trust and goodness and such, they would therefore be more accommodating. You would think so. Um, and that's a little confusing for me sometimes, too. Sometimes the sects break off for simple reasons, um, whether it's believing that women can also be a, a clergy member. There are many that don't believe that women can be a clergy member, and when, they, when a certain group embraced that, they broke off. Um, some believe that you are supposed to take... Um, a sacrifice of one of their deities, um, they call it the Eucharist, and it ingests what is symbolically um, blood and body. You're supposed to do that every week. Some believe you're only supposed to do it on certain occasions. And they haven't gotten down the acceptance of letting other people believe other things. And I think that's where the problem lies more than their belief system. It's in little details that they tend to break off of. Yeah, you get into problems when you get into groups that say in, that insist that your beliefs have to be exactly cookie cutter perfect to what they believe or you're going to hell. I mean... There's, there's, there's some that even, like, kind of look like that on the surface, but they're a little more flexible on some things. But some of them, you have to have every little bit, every little bitty detail just perfect. Or you're evil the, and possessed of Satan. The, the thing I find funny is that most Christians don't even read the full book. So there's all kinds of little frankly ridiculous rules that none of them even know about that they break on a daily basis yeah and keep so go that, ahead star oh, i was just going to uh, agree with saturn that you know there there are things in there and you know if you're trying to be a good supportive parent um you, you probably want to talk with your child and with whatever clergy that your child's working with before you try to be so very supportive because you know if you're not allowing your child to eat shrimp um because it's it's you know uh taboo according to the old testament of the bible the christian bible um you know that might not actually be something that they do um, and, and there are other things in there, you know, if you don't let your kid wear like a, a cotton rayon blend shirt, um, you know, because, you know, you're, you're trying to be supportive and in the Bible and make sure he only wears like, you know, uh, natural, natural, uh, fibers, you know, if you talk to your child's, you know, clergy, uh, they, they may actually tell you that, you know, that's not actually something that they do and, um, not all of those rules are actually, things that they follow or abide by. So. And keep in mind, this is, compared to a lot of pagan religions, this is still fairly new. 
So they're still trying to find their ground and they're still trying to be accepted. So there's bound to be some some silliness when it comes to the arguing who has it more right. I mean, it, it's growing pains. Yeah, I mean, come on. Every tradition has it. Just look at the fairy tradition. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You know, you know, one thing that, that pagan parents might not be aware of and that they, they sort of need to understand as their child gets involved with this is that, um, you know, in, in paganism, we, we, we place a lot of emphasis on the way you behave and what you do. Um, and, and Christianity, you know, they have that to some degree, but they, their main emphasis is, is on what you believe in your heart and soul. Um, and there, there's much more emphasis on what you believe and precisely how you believe it. Um, uh, and, and maybe not so much emphasis on action. So that may be something that you are you have a bit of a problem doing because you're very concerned with your child acting properly, behaving properly, doing good things. Um, and, and that may not be the same emphasis that they are receiving in their religious instruction, at, you know, at, in, in their Christian tradition. Yeah, and you go back to the, you go and take it back to the, the evangelization quota ridiculousness it, it, there's a clash between what they consider to be good behavior and then their goals that they have to meet you you wind up with people going out and trying to preach and witness and just generally getting in people's faces and being scary and rude and crazy looking and you're kind of you're more likely to shy away from them and you're embarrassed They'll wind up embarrassed. You're going to be embarrassed, and but but it goes with what they're supposed to be doing. So there's a lot of confusion as to how they're supposed to act on their part as well. You know, it just occurred to me. You know, if if your daughter, if you have a daughter and she's she's interested in Christianity, one one really big thing that you really need to be aware of as a as a pagan parent is that some of these Christian sects do not believe in birth control. And they do not believe in abortion. So you need to be very, very careful and make, make sure that you're really communicating with your daughter. Because if she meets some nice Christian boy and gets pregnant, um, that's going to alter her life forever. And by, and by don't believe in abortion, it's not like they don't believe it exists. It's that they don't believe it's something you can do and still be Christian. Right. Right. So, and some of them so, believe so. In, in conditions where it's okay and understandable, but it's still murder. And then some of them say it, it doesn't matter if you're raped or if this pregnancy is going to kill you. You have to have that child. And right. You, we wind up with conflicting messages, especially if, if your daughter's scared. Uh, yeah. It doesn't know how to handle it. Yeah. And, and it's, 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 sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Well, it's like in a lot of times, if if that kind of thing happens, and they're in a group that basically says that you shouldn't have done this in the first place, and you're pregnant, and so you're a whore because you're not married to the guy, blah 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 blah. They're not getting any support, and they're not good. You don't hold the same belief, and so they're going to be confused as to who to turn to. And basically, it's kind of they're just going to break down. You yeah, and it's how the, how they how they're feeling there. Sorry. Yeah. No, no. Um, you know, and w one thing you have to understand is, you know, they they have this idea that it's possible for teenagers to to not have um, any sort of sexual or erotic uh, contact until they uh, until they marry, and so they will they will they will some of these groups will actually. Um, convince your child that their their soul is in danger if they practice safe sex if they if they use contraceptives of some sort so so that's something you want to keep an eye out uh, and you want to be be concerned about because you you certainly don't want to be a grandparent um, well before you're ready for it and you also have yeah. to watch um, some of them will not specifically come out and say that so make sure that you talk to your child to see where their particular path they've chosen sits on that. And you also have to watch for the ones that encourage them to have children. Because there are ones that feel that the woman's job or the female's job is 
to bring children into the world. So you, you really have to make sure that your child knows what they're getting into and is aware. So, um, let me see if I got this right. Depending on which version of Christianity you're following, um, they generally agree that sex is bad and that you that it's wrong to have sex, which makes me think that the only way that there can be more Christians is if you bring some in from the outside since they can't make their own. Um, but if you do find yourself pregnant by whatever means, even violent, abusive, or unhealthy complications, you still have to go through with those anyway. Um, it yeah. can really depend on what stuff you're looking at. Some believe that if it's um, a child created of incest or rape that, or, or the mother may die, that it's kind of, sort of okay. Most of them don't. Okay. Um, the Shaker belief, which no longer exists anymore, precisely felt that to alter God's uh, given state of virginity um, would be a sin, since God creates perfection, and if you were to ruin the virginal state, you're ruining God's perfection. And they died out. Because well, they I imagine so. Um, they did <laughs> adopt children, but the rate of adoption was smaller than um, their rate of die-off. So the Shakers do not exist anymore. So there have been some sex to take it to the extreme. Um, you know, there's the hell a, these, mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's interesting that since God made people perfect and you're born a virgin, then you're only perfect if you remain a virgin. To become pregnant is to negate God's perfect creation. Okay, how about cloning? Uh, well, they're against anything that involves stem cell research or cloning. Um, most Christian beliefs would be. Um, because, um, I don't know if you remember Monty Python, every sperm is sacred. Of course. Okay. Yes, yes. So, every sperm is sacred. And if you were to, you know, life starts at um, conception, not at conception, actually, at, at penetration of sperm into, you know, the outer shell of an egg, life begins. Um, um, if, uh, okay, if every sperm is, is, is head, I'll, I'll try again. If every sperm is sacred, okay, um, if a... Man does not ejaculate after so much time sperm are reabsorbed, right? So that would be also against the creation because the purpose of the sperm is to make a child. Um, if So to spread sperm would be more holy than to be, what's the word, um, chased something, right? You can only spread it inside a woman's vagina. Not yet, because there is a quote in the Bible <laughs> that says it is better to your seed into the belly of a whore than upon uh, the ground. Um, so, but uh, sex is bad. But sex is bad. So they're saying masturbation is really, really bad because you're wasting. And yeah. I got into this discussion in school when I was going through high school. Um, you know, um, it's wrong for a male to masturbate and to ejaculate because they're wasting sperm, which is sacred. Um, right. But women don't release when they orgasm. So I always wanted to, you know, no, no one ever told me that, that female masturbation was okay, but really on that logic, um, really it's the guys that get the short end of the stick on this one. Okay, I'll, I'll posit these two, um, these two concepts and let you put the conclusion together for yourselves. If every sperm is sacred, but it's wrong to waste sperm, and eating the father is good, okay, I'll let you put those together and see where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's rough. Now, that's why, um, um, and I, I mean, I was, I was tossing around, this is only from a, a Catholic perspective that I can really speak upon. Um, but, I mean, I remember being 13, sitting down in my theology class with my teacher up there, listing everything I could not do in bed. 
Um, now, the only thing that is allowed for men <clears throat> is nightly emissions because you have no control over that. Okay. Um, so that, because it's a biological function and, and you did not consciously um, waste your sacred sperm, it's okay. Um, but um, uh, fellatio is a sin. Um, and anything that would force, that, that would cause you to not deposit sperm inside a vagina is a sin. Because sex is for procreation. And unless, you know, now if you need a little something extra to get to that phase, it's okay. But the end result has to be impregnation. And see, Snowballing? and that's the reason. Oh, go ahead, Sari. Snowballing? Sure, I can help out somehow. I mean, maybe a couple <laughs> rest stops along the way. Um, that is a sin. We ask that in class. Well, see, th th that's um, where you really need to make sure that you educate your, your child because, you know, it. Felicio actually can help uh, women get pregnant if, if their body is rejecting the sperm as a foreign entity. Um, that is a way for their body to become more used to it. So that's that's something that your child needs to be aware of when when they're when they're hearing this this suede science um, in in religious classes. You need to make sure that they they under, actually understand their own biology um, uh, their own biology. Um, really well and you know and they also need to understand you know when when they're talking about masturbation being bad and everything you know you don't want your son to develop a, a case of blue balls to the point that you have to take him to the doctor so you know they need to understand that you know although these things are being taught to them that they they need to be responsible for their own sexual health um okay um um I'm really not trying to be bad here. I'm not trying to play the devil's advocate. I'm trying to help them along with their concept. Is that why there are nuns? Is that what nuns are for? Recipients of. The nuns, in, instead of encouraging a relationship with other people. Some sects of Christianity believe that you need people that are married to the church instead of married to individuals. Um, it, it's sort of the idea of, of if you look in many of our past, there are priests and priestesses and clergy. Um, the nuns are married to the church and they're to keep the ideals pure well, and see to me that's so, just communism that's that doesn't uh have anything to um, do with self-reliance or individualism or bravery or courage or honor that's that's communism and that's escapism and that doesn't seem to be uh to be fitting for for well, pagan there's, children there's a couple of different things going on first of all there's a difference between a nun and a sister um a sister is someone who will go out and speak the word, they will do charitable work. They're the ones that you see working in uh, missions, they're working in hospitals, they're taking care of the elderly, they're teaching in schools. Okay. Nuns are ones who are cloistered, which means they never leave the walls of their convent. Um, a cloistered community builds upon the idea that the world can be influenced through meditation and prayer. Now, a nun or a sister is actually married to Christ. That is their husband. A priest or a monk is married to the mother church. Church is always considered as a female entity, almost a being unto itself. Um, Christ married the church um, when he died on the cross. So It's, it's like an egregore. Mm-hmm. Very much so. Um... There, a lot of the cloisters are filled with people that are trying to escape. Um, a lot of the missions, though, are, are really, you know, people that want to escape, but also um, are looking to do work in an active sense instead of a passive sense. Um, is it right or wrong? I, I don't know. I don't know if it, if it works or not. Um, 
and, and the only reason I know about this is I was really serious about becoming a nun. I really, I, I was talking to sisters and I was, I was getting, you know, what traditions I was looking at and I, I'm, I was very close to being that. Um, So, so maybe for some of the the pagans out here, what saved you from Christianity? At what point? The problem I had was, although I wanted to escape, and although I felt that a pious life would have been ideal for me, um, and I really was striving for structure, um, once I got past the fear that reading text outside of Christianity would not burst into flames in my hands. Um, I started realizing that Christianity was an amalgam of other religions, and I really wanted to get back to something more pure, because there was a lot of things in the Catholic Church in the hierarchy that I wasn't cool with. And then I started finding out, you know, that especially Catholicism and Christianity as a whole has all these pagan roots, so I think the thing that saved me from being a nun was that I would really like it if they believed in something other than Jesus. I was going to say before we got off the topic of nuns that Prior to nuns, they had virgins, which was a title for a woman who remained celibate into her 50s. Hmm. I had... Right, right. But, like, the Vestal virgins are, are, are different in that they were only supposed to be virgin for a period of time after which um, they were free to marry. The definition of virgin knighthood, which, of course, is a pagan origin definition, um, Celtic, I think, is that a virgin is a woman who is complete unto herself and has no need of man. Which means that anyone, any completely self-sufficient woman could be, by definition, regardless of where this actual life may have taken them, can be seen as a virgin. You know, I have I have sort of a question for everyone. You know, how how do you deal? Let's say you're you know you're doing laundry, you're picking up clothes off the floor, that sort of thing, and and you find that you know your child has like hidden um, a Bible, maybe some saints icons. How do you since since they are hiding it? Um, how do you do you approach it? Do you leave it alone? How, how do you deal with the, their sort of sneaking around uh, theologically? I think I, that... Hmm? Go ahead, Miles. Oh. Okay, thank you. I think that, like, if you found out that your kid has been smoking pot and you found a joint in a bag of weed stuffed under the mattress, if I was me... I would leave it on the coffee table so that they'd see it when they come home and they'd know that you know and you know that they know and so on. And then you would just have it out right there and talk about it. Don't blow your cool. Don't get, oh, oh my God, where did we go wrong? Just talk about it. Acknowledge that this exists. I think I would leave the Bible on the coffee table and so they come home and see the Bible there and it's obvious that you know it, that it's there because you put it there and so on. I don't know. I think, it, I think it's personal preference when it comes to me. Um, I worry that they, they may feel threatened and whereas I would be worried about them. Um, confrontation is good, but I, I worry about if they're hiding it, it, I would feel that they're already nervous enough about it that, um, I may try to bring up a conversation about having a, a friend and we were talking about Christianity or, you know, bring up some way and go, oh, and how... 
what does oh. what is your point on it and seeing if what they have to say and going from there if the conversation doesn't escalate and they don't see it as being something that they can feel free to talk about and and come out with it then i might i think i would agree with you then miles but that's that's just my personal preference I wonder if this is an education issue. I mean, if if your child has received a proper uh, interfaith education where they 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 learned about the different religions from an early age, would would you have fewer issues with their um, sort of sneaking around or or you know being religiously rebellious uh, as a teenager? It, do you guys think it would be an education issue? I think it mm-hmm. could be an education issue. My biggest fear, um, and I know I, I run into this with my stepson, is um, the motivation behind sneaking and the motivation behind um, immersing yourself into something without looking for um, your, your parental figure's input. You know, I would like to think that, you know, me as a parent would be um, kind of a de facto source, um, at least a sounding board. So anytime I I find um, my stepson kind of sneaking around, um, I feel like it's a failure on my part to not create a um, an environment where sharing new ideas is um, not something to be hidden. Well, I mean, one thing from the chat room is, you know, why why they feel the need to hide it in the first place is it might be an issue of openness and their understanding of what the the parents will approve of. You know, one thing that's just occurred to me is like one one reason you know your 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 child might try to explore other faiths is that you know pagan pagan groups tend to be very small and everything and and sometimes kids just want their own space away from their parents so i wonder if encouraging your child to visit with other pagan organizations that you trust and you know that they'll be safe with um is a way to give them their own their own religious and spiritual space without their having to sneak around behind your back i think giving them that freedom is good at the same time, if they're already getting to the point where they want to sneak, um, I would worry that pushing them towards that would would make them feel like you're not giving them credit to make their own decisions. And the idea that they may feel like you're patting them on the head and going, oh, aren't you cute? But here, here's more direction in the right way. So I think offering them that is good, but being careful that not to push them in the direction that we we have known to be healthy may actually cause more trauma to their emotional state. Does that make sense? Yeah, you know, I was thinking more before it gets to that point. If if you make a point of as they they get older and reach their teenage years, regardless of whether they're they're seeking in other faiths or not, um, mm. if you made a point to make sure that they have their own space to to explore their spirituality. But no, you make a very good point. Like after if if they've already started to explore something else, whether it's Christianity or or Buddhism or uh, Santeria or whatever. You know, um, if you then like try to push them, you know, you know, uh, into into other pagan groups that uh, that yeah, it's just going to reinforce the uh, rebellion. I think it depends on the individual, because I mean, I I do know of some kids that really like that close knit family, and they like that comfort. So I think it's on a individual basis, but I. I I will agree and say that yeah, if you notice that they're trying to branch out to give them to give them that, it might help. All right, since we've been recording for an hour and forty five minutes already, let's try to squeeze in another commercial while everybody captures their thoughts. So tonight we are also advertising Dropbox because it, we use it here on PCP. We're not getting any money from them, but we do get more disk space from them when you sign up using our URL of pagancenteredpodcast.com slash Dropbox. Why is Dropbox awesome? 
Well, first, it's free. You get to store files on the Internet for free. And it looks like a folder on your computer. So you just drag and drop stuff there. You can edit your documents there. You can go from one computer to another. You can go from Mac to PC and back again. It is absolutely amazing. It's also approved by the paranoid technopagans here on PCP. First of all, everything is strongly encrypted by default. It uses the same level of encryption for transmission as you use to log into your online bank. So really secure stuff. Second, it's really efficient. So let's say you work on this huge video file and you just change one tiny little thing. Well, with a lot of other programs, you have to re-upload that entire file. With this, it just uploads the modifications so it makes everything go really, really, really fast. So it's amazing. We use it here on PCP for post-production to spread around the love a little bit with the post-production. So check it out at PaganCenteredPodcast.com slash Dropbox. And we're back. The pain box. <laughs> it's only the pain box because it delivers work. <laughs> but then you deliver completed polished stuff, and then I get to polish it even more, upload it. You know, and you forget the fun stuff where we have new recipes. Yeah, average recipe collections on Dropbox. Yeah, my sister loves that, by the way. <laughs> Yay! That tell her that she needs to upload stuff. Oh, I can make bread today, Amber. Yay, Dropbox. Yay, Dropbox. We're all big fans <laughs> of Dropbox over here on PCP. Uh, just so go ahead. If you haven't gotten on Dropbox already, if you're like one of the three people on the planet that's not on Amber's recipe Dropbox yet, <laughs> pagancenteredpodcast.com slash Dropbox. I wonder what the roll call for that is. Amber's uh, recipe Dropbox. Um, I don't know, but I can look it up while we finish up. <laughs> this episode's giving me flashbacks, so, um, sorry I wasn't mu of much use. We have 25 members in the recipe folder. Wow, that's a, we got a lot of good recipes in there. I've contributed some recipes. Yep, and we have four people that are still waiting, so I think your sister, Scurvy, has yet to accept it. You sure? Yeah, because I don't see her. I have to talk to her then. I will send her another re-invite as we speak. There we go. Yeah, and anybody's ever used Google Locks, this is way easier to use than Google Locks. And that's saying a lot. Yeah. So I like your Google Docs because it has real time. You see where everybody is in a document, which is really good for live recordings, but Dropbox doesn't do that yet. But Dropbox has an amazing feature that, say, a certain somebody is a little bit too much with cleaning up disk space and deletes too many files. They have undelete. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Not that we've ever used that feature before. Sorry. I'm going to keep plugging Dropbox until you guys come up with something else to say. Because so we've lost the sarcasm of this episode. And now we've gotten, like, dead serious on this for, like, the past hour and 45 minutes for a sarcastic episode. I think that's actually funnier, though. It's not that we're sarcastic. It's like we're seriously concerned about your children converting to Christianity. Um, <laughs> we need, like, violin music in the background and Sally Struther is saying, think about the children. <laughs> Let's curve into flashbacks and stuff. I'm going to spend the next week in a fetal position. Thanks. Well, really, it is a concern. When you when you look at Christianity, you can see that it's designed to bring pagans over. Well, I, I think, Skurv, I think the problem here is that this somehow classifies as an other kin episode in your head, and that is why you're trying to curl up in a ball. <laughs> I mean, after all, you are talking yeah. about a human who thought he wasn't human. Oh my god, Jesus with other kin? <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're he is, into... He's the Lion of Judah. Furry? We have to somehow get Jesus into being a furry. I think that's the next step. <clears throat> He's the Lion of Judah, he is the Lamb of God, and he is the Dove of Peace. Jesus is a yip and furry. <sighs> and other kin. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> 
I apologize to the furry community for pushing Christ. <laughs> You've tainted them all. <laughs> Don't worry. We know. We all know you acts here on the show. We've made fun of them plenty of times. <laughs> but there are decent furries out there. He was a poor example of a furry. <laughs> You know, he was just, he was a poor example of many things, and I hope he's listening. And I'm done. That's that will speak with him. <laughs> and the name of Moses shall be stricken from every record and every obelisk. And, and we shall I... go with our cows. We shall go with our children. And we shall go with our sheep. Sorry, that's Moses. <laughs> <laughs> I just heard from uh, Nature Punk, so she said that she's free on Wednesday, so maybe next week we'll be interviewing her if we need an episode. Yeah, yeah, we don't have a topic yet for next week, so that'll be very good. And Nature Punk is absolutely amazing. She is absolutely amazing. Who is Nature Punk? That's for later, uh, Nature Punk is. Yes. Nature Punk is a really cool chick out on the west coast she works with a lot of animals that she gets from either um i think most of them actually come from the fish and game commission out there and she tans them um gets some from antiquing and makes some of its regalia like coyote headdresses or wolf headdresses some of it's just claws and the things that she makes, she has an Etsy account. Uh, let me look up that now while I'm talking. And part of what she gets for her pieces go back to trying to uh, a conservation project. So we're going to get her to talk about her work and... Uh, all the stuff that she's done. The Etsy shop is etsy.com slash shop slash nature punk. Yep, got it up on the video feed. Awesome. Cool. So I'm actually getting a coyote headdress off of her very soon here. Oh, yeah. Okay. So are we ready for final thoughts? Do you think? I think we are. Yeah, this episode kind of went to hell. Oh, pun. <laughs> That's funny for a ah, funny, funny, funny man. Well, you could you could do like um like a, a show I was recently on and you could just put like random pictures with captions um along with the audio. I thought about doing that and the most we did was Christ checks. That, that was the only <laughs> random thing I brought up in this whole episode. <laughs> Yeah, we were doing so tired, then all of a sudden, crash. It got all serious, because we're genuinely concerned about what we're supposed to be satirizing. You know, I will, I will, actually, I will, I will offer a cautionary tale before we do final thoughts. Sure. Um, the, the founder of my tradition, her children um, became evangelicals. And when she passed away... Um, they wouldn't they didn't want any of her religious and spiritual community to uh to be present in, in including uh you know people who had known her for thirty odd years. Um so the, I mean they even tried to hide her obituary so that uh, you know uh pagans wouldn't find it and um and limited her contact with uh, with her with her spiritual community that she had founded. So, and to my knowledge, she was you know she was not given a pagan burial. I, I don't know what kind of burial she may have been given a Christian burial, as far as I know. Um, you know, as far as I know, there could have been a a deathbed you know uh, surprise baptism. So, um, you know, it 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 is something to be concerned about. It, it generally it genuinely is. Um, pagans feel strongly about their ancestors and if your children are Christian then will they honor you as an ancestor that's is something to consider which leads one to think that means that if, you're, if your children do go into a Christian faith they then have the right to to deny their ancestors the 
memory and observation of the ancestor's choice. Actually, depending on the branch of Christianity that they join, they actually might uh, feel that it is perfectly appropriate to baptize their ancestors posthumously. posthumously. I can't pronounce that. After they're dead. Baptize them after they're dead. Um, there, are, there are some branches of Christianity that do that. I confess I've wondered. Um, insanity is a new religion. There are, there are centuries of history from before Christianity existed. Um, and yet people who are not Christian are doomed to eternal peril, something, something in the Christian hell. Um, and allegory of that, I'll get back to my main topic in just a moment, and I guess this qualifies as my final thought, and allegory to that is, suppose that there are, there are um, two school students, Jennifer goes to Jefferson High School, she's always gone to Jefferson High School, Wanda goes to Washington, she's never gone to Jefferson. Because Wanda has never gone to Jefferson High School even once, this means that she has to serve detention at Jefferson High School because she's missed so many classes at Jefferson High School because she was never enrolled in it. Um, but getting back to the thought I was beginning with, there were all these centuries of pre-Christian history, they, I suppose, assume that anyone who is not Christian is therefore suffering the Christian torment and punishment of not being Christian. So they put blame, guilt, death, torture, whatever else, on people who are not Christian simply because it hadn't been invented yet. That's not true, though. Um, if okay. you actually look at their... If, there, if you actually look at it, uh, <clears throat> yeah, all the sins got washed away when Jesus uh, died on the cross. That's what they believe. So, ah. no, one, no one before uh, zero, uh, year zero are, is right. in hell. Oh, or, okay. Uh, year 35, whatever you want to say. I don't know how old he was. Yeah, there's, there's part of a creed that they say at mass that Jesus died, he went to hell for three days, and then he rose again, and he went to hell to gather the souls of those who had been down there before. But they were there. They were there, right? In the Christian faith, in the Christian faith, yes, and he had to go rescue them and, and, and do a jailbreak. Um, yeah. But, um, um, yeah. so that, and that's um, another thing, like, there's so many Christian sects that it's hard to I mean, these are the little minute things that, that break sex off of each other. You know, um, dietary restrictions and, and, like, the littlest thing is really what accounts for just the multitude of different types of Christianity. So it's, it's kind of, I can really only, the only thing I've talked about so far is Catholicism, because that's the only thing I know. But to the Catholic faith, yes, the souls were in hell, and then Jesus did a jailbreak. Um, souls are in hell, going back, see, they don't believe in evolution, it's all creation, it's when God said, oh, let's make some people, and boink, there's Adam and Eve. Um, going back to, I presume, Adam and Eve, who were in hell, as well. Um, so, there is no hell for Australopithecus. Right. Well, well, no, because only humans have souls, and Australopithecus is a different species. No, that's a pile of crap. Okay. Fine. <laughs> only, only Homo sapiens. <laughs> only Homo sapiens. Oh, no. <laughs> um. So you. So if you. So if you're. If your child who wants to become a Christian, or let's assume already is a Christian, wants to convert to Christianity the cat or the dog, they're completely wasting their time. Well, that would be considered a, a sin. That would be considered a travesty. 
animals do not have souls. All dogs so, do not go to heaven, kind of thing. <laughs> um, um, okay. I think all of this has convinced me. If you want a final thought, I would have to say that anyone who has a blithering ounce of common sense can see that they would be completely wasting their bloody time. Yeah, but the atheists say the same thing about us. That's because they choose to believe in void. Uh, oh. My final thought is that I completely disagree with Sam. I saw the cartoon movie with Burt Reynolds' voice, um, and, and dogs do go to heaven. They, they sang about it and everything, and and I, I I have to I have to respectfully disagree with her on that. There I will I will post a link. There was a war between two churches, one Catholic and one Protestant. You know how oh, they I put saw little that cute one. Signs yes, it was up? on the marquees. All yeah. dogs all dogs are saved, and so on and so on. Yeah, the back and right. forth. Rock, like if you believe dogs are, are saved, are saved. going to hell, and it got really yeah. nasty. I thought it was funny. You know, at one point, at one point, there was a huge debate within the Catholic Church as to whether or not women had souls. Yep. Really? Not kidding. Wow. Um, I'm going to get a final thought in here because this episode's like brought back trauma. I thought I forgot, so I'm going to go find a teddy bear and curl up in a fetal position for a week. <laughs> we broke scurvy. <laughs> He broke the scurvy. Well, my final thought on this whole mess comes straight from the, the show notes, and it's that Christians do not worship Set or Loki, but they do apparently worship a nuclear bomb explosion and something resembling a horny goat man. <laughs> <laughs> I read that. What's a nuclear explosion about? Uh, because just, because the thing is, if you get close to the if you get close to God in the Christian uh, mindset. What happens is is that he'll be so bright that he will blind you. And if he speaks, he'll be so loud that he'll ah. make you deaf. Oh, like in, um, like, Dogma. oh, what the crap was the singer's name who played God in Dogma? Alanis Morissette played Thank God. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. And everyone said, cover your, cover your ears. ears. And yeah. had one word. yeah, that was cool. I like that movie. I, I'm very disappointed in that movie because Alan Rickman was uh, completely without genitalia. <laughs> <laughs> That's your criteria? I am a big fan of Alan Rickman. It was Alan quite Rickman disappointing. Good. <laughs> I literally have crickets here. <laughs> Yay, crickets! <laughs> I think my final thought is I remember the reason that me and Dave had had kind of talked about doing the episode is I was I was getting accosted with people going, "Oh my God, my child is pagan! What do I do?" And we thought it would be kind of funny. <laughs> so, yeah, we weren't all kinds of serious. So. We did go all kinds of serious, but at the same time, we really didn't. Because in in a way, if we really went serious, I th think we could have taken a different route with it. Yeah, I guess. I just think it went a step to the left of being satire. It wasn't. It wasn't SNL satire. It was more like Rain Wilson on The Office satire. Yeah. I think it was like John Stewart's even Colbert satire, which I'm proud to I be like a part of. I we're comparing ourselves to big-name celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. We win. <laughs> <laughs> and Peter Dye being left. Where? Yeah, his connection was shoddy. Oh, well. We have Star, though, and she does count as a celebrity. So. She does. No, no, I don't. Yes, no. you I bloody do. do. Your blog no. was part of the curriculum I took for a class at Cherry Hill Seminary. That means that you are a celebrity. Get over it. And Miles that is, is terrifying, Miles. That is absolutely <laughs> terrifying. It's wow, good. star being What's a that celebrity, Sam? that's like me being a role model. 
And Miles is a celebrity because he's our most searched person. Yes, he yeah, is. Yeah, what's up yeah. with that? What is uh, up with that? We don't know. We don't know. We think you have, a, we, to... you have a mystery cult following. We don't understand who these people <laughs> are yet. Oh, Lord. I, I, I don't know. I don't want to be a celebrity. The star is famous. She got hate mail on the PCP website. Yeah, yeah I, I need to go and listen to that and figure out what that's all about so I can I can <laughs> I can talk to Dave about it. But I think oh. Miles just must be really popular in Asia because our like your isn't your biggest demographic from China? Our second largest uh our second largest uh demographic is from China. That is correct. Okay, weird. Um Oh David, I have a um Suggestion for a country podcast. I would love to host a pagan trivia night. Yeah, but that's that. That's like saying what? universal trivia night. I mean, you can just bake anything up. <laughs> no, um, I'm well. I can ask questions relevant to different pagan traditions. I'm not not. Just going to arbitrarily make things up. I'll have books, and of course, since all you guys have the internet at your disposal, finding the answers should be bloody easy. So it actually won't be much of a trivia night, will None it? None of it's hmm. found. <laughs> <laughs> In that case, I Her. win every question. I just can't tell you the answer. And- <laughs> and the prize we worked on this last week was to be. The prize for the winner of the trivia was to be either Star Foster's or Peter Dibing's voice on their home answering machine. <laughs> right? Oh my yes. god. If somebody wants that, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what happened to you in your childhood. But I, I'm sorry. Well, I, I thought the prize was going to be they get to post produce that episode, but that sounds much better. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, you really don't want me post producing the episode. That's like asking me to decide if you you're well or not. <laughs> I'd actually uh, be interested to see this. No. This means I just have to write up some sort of scoreboard app so I can have it on a video. By the way, nobody that's actually participating in the show can see the awesomeness of the new video feed. So, so everybody's going to have to run out and just watch it on YouTube afterwards because it is just full of win. Okay. Full of win. Yay. So we still have Sam, Noria, and Saturn uh, for final thoughts. Well, my final thought is a little long, but... But you said you wanted to break Christian's minds with it, so let's go for it. Hey, now. My final thought is as a current-slash-former hermetic practitioner, the best source for accurate Christian information is, of course, Christian demons. Now, personally, I recommend Leviathan. As Besides being absolutely frickin' adorable... Factually, 100%. There you go. My final thought is all first, uh, first generation pagans uh, question, question their faith. And if that's a genetic thing, we better start panicking now. Oh, wait, we're not supposed to panic. Don't panic. <laughs> It's in, it's in uh, really reassuring letters right at the top of the show notes. <laughs> Big friendly it's letters, that's too right. too late! Barrett said it! I'm panicking! <laughs> hey, you took my final thought, though. I hate you all. <laughs> <laughs> i got to come up with another final thought. Um, I think my final thought is... Uh... uh I don't know. Don't be afraid if your children turning Christian because really it's still paganism, so they're good. <laughs> nice. Is there still a Saturn around here? No, there isn't. Okay, so we're not waiting on Saturn. Of course, in multiple S. 
All right, so that's it for this exhilarating episode of PCP, the Pagan Center Podcast. Remember, you can always find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash pcppodcast, or you can follow us on Twitter at P- PCP Podcast on Twitter. Next week, we hope to be talking to the Nature Punk Girl, as we previously mentioned, and we'll be back with our new and awesomely improved video feed, which will be posted to YouTube and on our site at uh, under the show's listing. Just go to PCP Uncut. And that's it for this week. We'll see you all next week, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. PCP Uncut. Well, we're on Uncut because there's too many goddamn words. <laughs> We're not Christian, PCP so we're uncircumcised. Not I like that. Oh, I meant to touch on that. Ah, that. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs>